Welcome to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. John, last week you talked about clean tech and the Syerston Nickel Cobalt Scandium Project in Australia. The company presented at the BMO Mining Conference in Florida where it made a big announcement. Can you tell us what it means? Well, clean tech made a stunning announcement that it had raised 81 million Australian at 88 cents from a Chinese Shanghai stock exchange listed company called Ping Chen Mining, which is also planning to help uh, clean tech uh, raise the 700 million U.S. it will eventually need to develop its Syerston nickel cobalt sulfate uh, project, which also potentially has a scandium byproduct. This puts uh, Cleantech's uh, fully diluted capitalization up to $600 million, and uh, the stock is now poking at a dollar, trying to break through on dollar on the upside. Uh, so $600 million valuation for basically the Syerston project. Now, what was interesting is that uh, uh, the, the, the amount, $81 million Australian, is about what it would cost for Scandium International to put uh, uh, its 80 to fund its 80 percent share of putting Ningen into production as a primary standalone project. Now Friedland's uh, Robert Friedland's Clean Tech has almost enough money now to put its own Syerston standalone uh, primary Scandium scenario into production. However, that is unlikely to happen because the net present value of that scale is considerably less than the $600 million market valuation, which is now pretty much hinged to the upside potential for the nickel-cobalt battery market-aimed uh, scenario. And, of course, cobalt uh, exceeded $23 a pound. It continues to trend up. There's a lot of uh, 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 stir starting about uh, we're into a cobalt bull market uh, uh, the the battery makers are starting to panic as they contemplate that we well we are pretty vulnerable relying on the on the Congo for uh, over 50 percent of the world's cobalt supply so uh, um, I think they are going to stick with that scenario they cannot file a mining lease until they have the development modification consent and they don't want to file for a mining lease until they finish their definitive feasibility study for the big scenario, which is at the end of the year. So the question that obviously comes up is, why did they raise 80 million Australian right now? Well, one obvious scenario is that uh, while they advance the nickel cobalt scenario, which uh, wouldn't be in production until 2020 and beyond, and which could have a very healthy 100 uh, 100 ton per year scandium oxide byproduct, uh, why not at the same time develop the Ningen deposit? Well, Ningen, of course, is owned by Scandium International, and uh, it still needs to raise $100 million. So it isn't a stretch of the imagination to speculate that uh, maybe it has crossed Robert Friedland's mind that at some point it would be strategic to own Scandium International and develop the Ningen deposit uh, as a primary scalable scandium mine and set the stage for building the market for offtake of the 100 tons uh, a year that he will end up generating when he gets his nickel cobalt uh, sulfate system uh, uh, in, in, in operation. And of course, that isn't, of course, a very good prospect for Scandium International shareholders whose shares are still sitting there around 30, 35 cents with a uh, implied valuation of only a hundred million dollars for a project that uh, is going to be the first one in production and can scale up to over a hundred tons a year itself. However, I, they are exhibiting at PDAC next week and a little birdie has told me that uh, I should uh, make sure I visit the booth because there may be some people present uh, uh, in the booth who are not management whose identities will be very interesting. Uh, I think we're going to see a coming out party from a certain party that uh, could play an important role in the future of this company. Don't know for sure, but uh, it's going to be very interesting at PDAC for Scandium International. How did Rainy Mountain's rights offering work out last week? Well, if, 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 if our audiences will recall, uh, Rainy Mountain did a 10 cent unit rights offering that had a complicated guarantee for about 600,000 by 
a Vancouver brokerage firm called Mackey Research. And it turns out that only 60% of the rights were exercised. However, those parties who did exercise oversubscribed for 110% of that for which they did exercise. And the interesting thing, what happens in a situation like that is whatever is left over that other shareholders' rights that they let die, those end up getting prorated on the basis of if you applied for 100,000 shares, you would get, say, 62% of that. If you applied for 10,000 shares, you would get 62% of that because that's the amount that was available. So it turned out that the entire offering, $1.3 million uh, worth, was fully subscribed thanks to the oversubscription privilege. The brokerage from Mackey uh, Research did not have to put up any money to make sure um, that uh, the minimum financing got done. And for that, uh, for being there ready to do that, they now have two million two-year warrants at 13 and a half cents. Uh, so uh, they have uh, some incentive to uh, support the company. Rainy Mountain has now started a geophysical program on its uh, Brunswick project to uh, make sure that it uh, include the grid includes uh, some porphyry outcrop that they uh, uh, found while prospecting next last year, and they hope to be drilling by the end of March. Uh, uh, and, and demonstrate that uh, on this right out fault, we have uh, another significant gold system similar to the Borden project discovered by uh, probe mines. We'll have more Discovery Watch with We'll have more Discovery Watch with John Kaiser right after the break. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent-pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest-cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com, or phone us at 604-924-5504. Welcome back to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. John, you've complained about warrant overhangs created by the dilutionary financings juniors have had to do during the past couple of years. While bear market conditions persisted, I understand that San Marco published some good news on that front this week. Well, this problem of um, you know companies having to do five cent, ten cent financings in large amounts, ten, twenty million units and then having a, a full war and blasting for several years there. Um, this has become a big problem for many of the juniors because the uh, play C's, they understand the time value of their warrants and they are reluctant to exercise those warrants until they absolutely have to, such as when the stock is way in the money and, and they're not collecting anything for those warrants. So all that dilution doesn't really help the company. It harms the company because other investors look at this overhang and say, why should I give you money at the current market price when these other guys have all this uh, free lunch on it? So in the case of San Marco, uh, management had asked its warrant holders, you know, if we want to get this company properly financed to pursue this uh, new strategy that we have developed, it would be very helpful if you would voluntarily exercise your warrants way before you have to. In the case of San Marco, it turns out it has a very strong shareholder base. Last June, there were 24.5 million warrants at, you know, prices 10 cents or, or lower. Um, since then, this has been reduced to 8.7 million warrants. Just in the last three months, 7.6 million warrants were exercised, uh, topping up the company's treasury with an extra $700,000. So now when you look at the difference between issued and fully diluted, it is a much smaller percentage difference, and the company looks a lot stronger. And interestingly, 
the stock has not been a significant trader. There is no way that the uh, warrant holders were able to sell any of their original stock or any of the warrants that they got uh, from exercising. The warrants, they, they were in the money. The stock has been in the sort of 15 to 25 cent raise range. So, so this is a really good sign. And uh, the company put out that news release uh, yesterday. They also announced that they are now fully permitted on the Chonibas project in in Mexico. Uh, this is the project. Uh, this is unfinished business from its earlier incarnation before they got involved with the Globetrotters group and their uh, Aster anomaly uh, story. So uh, th- this project was drilled during the 90s. And uh, the focus was on... Uh, sort of high-grade structures, fairly shallow RC holes. Uh, San Marco would like to do a modest drill program of about four holes or so that are largely geological scout holes because what they think is that while the focus in the past seems to have been on high-grade structures that probably need to be ultimately underground mine, prospecting work that they have done shows that the Chinimas project has significant mineralized lateral extent and could end up being an initially a bulk sample open pit scenario with possible uh, underground mining if the structures turn out to persist at depth. So it's it's still an early stage project, not a discovery yet, but if they go in there and spend their $150,000 on this scout drilling program, at the very least they will have a geological context for making this case to farm this this uh, project out to a bigger company which is looking for this type of thing, or if the numbers are good enough to continue with it on its own. The company, I suspect, would prefer to uh, get good enough numbers simply to farm it out because it is getting very excited about its Aster strategy. And as, 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 as our audience may recall, um, the Aster data is satellite data that's basically in the public domain which uh, Richard Osmond's Globetrotters group reprocessed using their own algorithms to generate a potential alteration systems in Sonora State that have never been recognized. And so they teamed up with uh, Bob Willis's San Marco team to sift through over 1,600 such anomalies and whittle it down to several dozen, which are not explained by existing mines or are in areas that uh, are already owned by strong groups. And they are now systematically going through these ground truthing these projects, making sure that this, this is, these are the right rocks, checking out the, uh, the title situation, and uh, negotiating deals, staking them when it's open. One of the first ones to come out of the chute is something they call number 1068. And they're only giving it a number at this point because they're still acquiring some surrounding ground. But they're pretty excited about this. This is the long story for this company, this this using a remote sensing derived digital data to generate virgin targets, alteration systems that could either be porphyry or epithermal systems that nobody has ever taken a modern exploration look at. During the past couple of weeks, there have been signs of an emerging area play in Quebec. A hundred million dollars has been raised by companies with projects in the Windfall Urban District. Penny Juniors are announcing acquisition of claims in the area. One junior has traded over 50 million shares after announcing that it had received unspecified offers for the claims it holds in the Windfall Urban Area. What's going on here? The Windfall Urban District in Quebec, south of Shibugamu, uh, has been known for many decades. In fact, uh, in the 80s, I got my first uh, boiler room call from somebody promoting the windfall story. I, as I, when I was a research analyst uh, uh, in Vancouver, I, I got a call saying uh, the results are fantastic. They look like a jewel box. The stock's going to rocket in the morning. Well, the company did put out results, and they were good results, high-grade gold results, but the stock did not rocket. And the reason is the Windfall District has been known for a long time to have very splashy gold grades, but the zones don't hang together very well. Now, over time, about 1.6 million ounces have been outlined in the Windfall Deposit. Uh, Much of that work was done by Eagle Hills uh, uh, a few years ago, which acquired the project from Noront, uh, 
after Noron became focused in the McFowles uh, Lake area of northwestern Ontario. Uh, 1.6 million ounces of uh, sort of 7 to 8 grams gold would sound seem to be very, very interesting, but it's all in these scattered sort of plunging narrow lenses, and they don't make for a very good mineable uh, scenario. And the Eagle Hill did publish a PEA for a 1,200 ton per day underground uh, mining operation in 2015, and uh, and they ended up, uh, they used $1,200 as a base case price, and the numbers still weren't very interesting. It was basically a dud. But uh, a couple of months after that, uh, a significant event happened. Osisco Mining, of course, had been taken over, and uh, and uh, Osisco Gold Royalties had been spun out, and the team of Sean Rusin and uh, John Berzinski had a couple of shells, one of them being Oban Mining. Ned Goodman had a couple of cash-rich companies, Corona Gold and, and Ryan Gold, whose original stories had fizzled. So this idea was was uh, was developed to merge uh, Oban, Eagle Hill, Ryan Gold, and Corona Gold to create a substantial company with this windfall project as its flagship project and, and 30, 40 million dollars in the treasury. And the, the geological brains behind the, uh, the, 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 the Osisco mining group right from the start, uh, when the Malartic deposit was, uh, was recognized as an open pitable scenario is Bob Wares. And he came up with this idea. Let's use Osisco mining, the reincarnation of the original Osisco mining, as distinct from the Osisco Gold Royalties Company that also trades. Let's let's gather up these old districts that have been sort of forgotten and neglected, and apply a major rethink. And what Osisco mining has been doing in the past year is literally using its healthy treasury to brute force drill the windfall deposit and see if there is something better there than what has historically been dismissed as a, as a bunch of ratty little uh, high-grade uh, quartz veins uh, hosted by the volcanics that do not really add up to anything. And uh, what seems to have happened, and this is really interesting, there is no like big blockbuster Hemlo-style a uh, 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 drill intersection like hole 76, all of a sudden all this little ratty stuff that uh, we've been poking away at. Uh, all of a sudden we have a big indicator that there's a 20 million ounce uh, hemlo deposit of say 8 to 10 grams per ton in the making. No, it is something very different. What has emerged is a shift in the understanding of the geological engines that have driven the mineralization in this camp. And what Bob Wares was explaining to me recently is that the drilling has intersected these porphyry dikes, which lead them to believe that this situation is very similar to what drives the gold mineralization in the Timmins camp. And ironically, it was a barren dike that sort of cuts through the whole windfall system called the Red Dog, uh, which they managed to age date and were able to determine the, uh, the, the age of the mineralization. And it turns out to be the same age as the Timmins camp. So what has started to happen, even though there is are no new resource estimates out there um, or any fantastic intersection, uh, the realization has emerged that this windfall urban district is potentially far more interesting than it has been the case uh, in the past. And, uh, and, and so Osisco has expanded its land position to include most of the surrounding ground, and we now have a uh, a situation where Bay Street has caught on and uh, have, have put a lot of money into the uh, company. There's a 400,000 meter drill program underway. There is no way that uh, five years ago anybody would have said, why would you drill 400,000 meters with anything to do with the windfall deposit? So so this this is creating a lot of buzz about the emerging windfall district as a potentially major new camp where there are only, uh, you know, several million ounces known to exist at present. Where has the $100 million raised this year ended up? Well, Cisco has raised $82 million of that in both hard and flow-through dollars at prices ranging from three forty to five fifty. That gives the company uh, probably a $700 million market cap at this 
stage, which is which is quite impressive, given uh, uh, the relatively early stage of uh, published resources on the project. Bonterra Resources, uh, which owns the Gladiator property to the south of Windfall, has raised almost $15 million through a bot deal. And by the way, it's very interesting that these are bot deals that are being done, not just the best efforts financings by Bay Street. In the case of Bonterra, Eric Sprott took down a big chunk of that financing. And another company, Bowfield Resources, they raised $6 million in a bot deal uh, a few weeks ago, of which Osisco Mining, the owner of all Windfall and all that surrounding uh, land, took down just over half to become the largest uh, single shareholder of Bowfield. I understand that Bowfield has become the target for a dissident shareholder group and that the CEO for the past couple of decades resigned on Thursday. Furthermore, Bob Wares of Osisco has been appointed chairman. What's going on here? Well, this dissident shareholder group emerged a, a couple weeks ago unhappy about the destiny of the company. Now, Jens Hansen has been CEO of Bowfield for, for a couple decades. He was also a CEO of, uh, of Melchior Resources. Uh, uh, w- one of the uh, people that's been sitting on his board uh, is, is, is Bernie Deleuze from the uh, Porter Airline family. This is a sort of a um, short haul airline in, in, that operates in Ontario, Quebec, and in the northeastern U.S. area. Uh, another person, Jim Deleuze, ended up taking over Melchior to run it uh, his way. Um, Bofield also has a, a Chinese group as a shareholder. And uh, they finally got upset because nothing was happening. Here was this big windfall uh, area. Uh, Bofield has owned claims in this area at least since the 90s. Uh, Bofield has a history of uh, a strategy of doing proximity plays. Uh, uh, Jens Hansen has a very good nose for emerging stories. For example, he was able to uh, pick up land near the Eleanor, Virginia's Eleanor discovery in, in 2004 and managed to raise quite a bit of money on that. And then he'll do some work on whatever proximity property he has, and usually it's no, not very good for anything. And then he'll sit back and sort of uh, sit on the money and watch for the next opportunity that can uh, uh, attract market interest. And, and this has been a strategy over over the past couple decades. Uh, it hasn't really led Bowfield to make any fundamental success. So this group finally got upset. And ironically, it turns out that these claims that Bowfield acquired a couple decades ago, the Rulo and the Golden Retriever, they're sort of smack in the middle of this windfall urban district to where 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 can't where 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 Osisco has, you know, rethought the geological potential. And uh and so what happened is uh uh, Osisco Mining was eager to get this company uh, um, to um, um, start drilling the, the Golden Retriever property, which has the projection of the new Black Dog Zone that uh, Osisco has uh, has sort of rediscovered. It was a zone known to exist. Uh, it was associated with a magnetic anomaly that fizzles out along with the mineralization not too far from the Golden Retriever border. Nobody ever bothered stepping farther to the southwest of this because it's covered by swamp and uh, since there was no geological reason to do so, nothing was ever done. Uh, except now that we have some additional geophysical surveys, it shows that the magnetic anomaly reappears after a bit of a break and uh, with uh, whatever it is that the Osisco is discovering about what drives the mineralization at windfall and particularly in the Black Dog, all of a sudden this Golden Retriever project uh, is very interested. interesting. And and Jens had gotten work, a little program going on the Rouleau project uh, where there is a known gold zone and they've, they've got assays pending on that. But they have just started a modest drill program in the Golden Retriever area where no holes have ever been drilled. And uh, and this, of course, was what attracted Osisco. Uh, Bofield obviously wasn't going to do a farm out, farm out, uh, farm out deal, nor was it going to be easy to uh, let itself be taken over, especially with this other substantial shareholder group. And and so uh, I, I believe it was a friendly deal. However, Jens Hansen resigned yesterday on 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 Thursday. Uh, Bob Wares has become chairman. Bob Wares, of course, is the geological brains behind. Uh, 
behind Bowfield. And uh, the dissident group is trying to disallow the Osisco share block of 31 million shares from being voted. Uh, the annual meeting has been postponed. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens, whether those shares are allowed. But I think at this stage with uh, $8 million in the bank uh, and the company well positioned to start drilling this, the Golden Retriever project, uh, uh, getting getting some first time ever drill holes in the projected extension of the Black Dog Zone, and probably the Rouleau project itself getting a completely fresh look. All of this bodes very well for Bowfield uh, Resources finally having its uh, windfall projects turn into a, a discovery uh, discovery style uh, story. John, can you tell us about the closeology hype that the windfall district has started to attract? Well, this has been a, a, a very interesting development in, in the last couple of weeks. And, uh, we, you know, we've seen the $100 million go into the companies with, uh, with, with, with decent projects uh, within the windfall urban, urban district. Uh, uh, sign, signs that there is something big going on are evident in one company, Durango Resources, which uh, is one of these lifestyle companies which is uh, pursuing medical marijuana one day, lithium another. More recently, they're picking up industrial mineral projects in British Columbia. Well, this company had a property called the Trove, which is to the south of Bowfield's uh, Golden Retriever project and happens to be now surrounded by Osisco ground. They acquired this in 2010 and last did some work in 2011. Well, in 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 mid in mid February, they put out a news release pointing out that uh, they owned this property. And guess what? Osisco's well, raising all kinds of money, and the market yawned and did absolutely nothing. Then on the 24th um, of, of February, uh, last Friday. They put out a news release saying that they had received two offers for the Trove project. Now, they didn't say what kind of offers, but uh, the innuendo is, oh, it must be Osisco. Maybe Osisco wants to take them over, or maybe it wants to uh, option the properties. Well, at that moment, the stock went berserk. It traded 24 million shares. On Monday, they put out another news release saying that uh, we have received a third unsolicited offer for the Trove project. And since then, the company has traded over 75 million shares when it only has about 34 million shares outstanding. This is a classic pump and dump where the context of an emerging major play has been utilized by various traders and so on to uh, uh, create a story. And then the algo traders get in there and the stock starts trading. And it has run from six, seven cents where it started a week ago to as high as 26 cents. And there's no reason to take their news releases seriously. If they actually had Osisco Mining talking to them about doing a deal, their lips would be sealed. So this is probably some clownish other company, maybe even just a, a, one of their own, uh, you know, you know, some somebody loosely connected to the company sent them an offer about it. They published it and created this false illusion that there is a fundamental interest in this project. And another sign of, um, you know, sort of the uh, that the whole area play psychology is kicking in is another little junior trading at three four cents which uh, just a few weeks ago was announcing that it's interested in getting uh, corporate growth drivers in the area of base metals, battery metals, agriculture, edibles, beverages, and medical situations. You know, two of these areas are code names for lithium and marijuana, uh, popular tailgating uh, stories for flaky little juniors. Uh, this company also got announced that it was quoted on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange you know, so that uh, German suckers can uh, buy the stock in the belief that they're getting uh, uh, shares in a company that's going to acquire a meaningful piece of land in the um, in the in the new windfall in the emerging windfall urban district uh, the company's name is Spearmint Resources but it really is a breath of bad air 
So neither of these companies, Durango or Spearmint, deserve to be uh, Discovery Watch candidates. If you want to be playing this emerging windfall district play, take a look at another much more quiet and obscure junior called GFK Resources, which is currently drilling uh, uh, the Vaitsa projects in the Casa Berardi district, which happens to own the Fecto project, which is to the east of the uh, windfall deposit, uh, happens to be surrounded by Osisco right now. The company acquired it last June from a prospector who knew the Tony Tony Brisson, who is the geological brains behind GFK. Tony at the time liked the project on its own merits. It was existing in this area, independent of whatever um, uh, hype in the past might have driven interest in the in the windfall district. They acquired the project. They are they have done a geophysical survey for which they are awaiting results. Um, this is the kind of project if you like these emerging area play. This is the kind of project that one should look for. And I would regard GFK Resources FECTO project as a discovery watch candidate simply because it'll be a wonderful case study of how the market dynamics works uh, for properties that um, you know six, eight months ago, nobody could care less about them. But when the whole uh, perception of, of a region changes because of a rethink uh, uh, this is the kind of obscure project and in a tiny little junior with uh, with, with some serious uh, people, uh, all of a sudden uh, it comes to life and everybody will be knocking on the door of a company of a project like that. We'll have more Discovery Watch with John Kaiser right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray at 778 574 Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. John, with Osisco Mining, you've given us a big exploration junior whose exploration budget for the Windfall Urban District you think will create buzz at PDAC. Can you give us an example of a PDAC junior at the opposite end of the market cap spectrum, which has a discovery story you think is worth watching? Well, the company I'd like to introduce is Lorraine Copper, which is run by a pair of classic toiling geologists, Bill Morton and Glenn Garrett, Vancouver-based. Uh, I happen to own shares in this company. I haven't even made it a bottom fish recommendation yet, though it deserves to be this. They, these these geologists, uh, I could almost literally, uh, I mean, they are flying with a plane to Toronto where they have a booth for Loring Cap. For, for Lorraine Copper, um, but the company has what twenty five million shares out, trading at seven cents or so, uh, has has a pitiful market cap. It is indeed at the opposite end of the uh, uh, market valuation spectrum as Osisco Mining. But these guys, they're, they're like loaded up their uh, uh, um, figurative picket pickup truck, uh, are heading out to Toronto. They've recently acquired a property called the Lust Dust property, which happens to be uh, to the northwest of uh, Serengeti's Quanica project, where a, uh, a copper gold resource has been outlined, uh, where uh, a Korean company, Daewo, is earning 35%, uh, uh, where there's evidence that there could be a lot more to that project. The Lust Dust itself is a relic 
article of the Vancouver Stock Exchange passed. Uh, for the past 20 years or so, uh, a company called Alpha Gold, run by uh, uh, an individual, raised and spent over $10 million chasing these SCARN carbonate replacement style zones of high grade zinc, gold and silver hosted by limestones in this property. And, and the resource that was put together was, was smallish, c- kind of a similar situation to windfall. You know, you get splashy numbers and uh, it just never hanged together. Even tech owned the property for a while, did some work and, and then got distracted and, and dropped the option. Well, the the key principal, George Watley, uh, passed away a few years ago, and uh, the company decided, well, we don't want to do this anymore. And so they sold the property to Lorraine Copper for, for about five and a half million shares. Uh, Alpha Gold underwent a uh, rollback uh, listed on the Canadian Stock Exchange and recently distributed that stock to the um, to its shareholders. So this potential big overhang in the way of these toiling geologists who uh, who uh, have an amazing inability to promote uh, promote their stock, uh, but do excellent technical work and have actually managed to generate a number of companies from the original parent company Eastfield uh, Resources in, in the past two decades. Well. They don't have to deal with that overhang anymore because it's been dispersed amongst the Alpha Gold uh, shareholder base. What they are doing is rethinking the potential of this system. In the past, it was a group that did not really have strong geological vision behind the work. It was sort of classic, uh, let's keep chasing the high-grade numbers bit by bit, and every year, we put out some more nice intersections, um, raise some more money, keep the story going, and maybe one year we'll latch into a huge intersection. The kind of thing that happened with Hermosa Taylor where you you step out and all of a sudden you're into a, a major um, uh, uh, a zinc, lead, silver carbonate replacement system. So this project is now in the hands of geologists who understand how to interpret the data how to come up with new strategies. And uh, they're out there with their equivalent of a pickup truck, uh, a tiny little booth at PDAC, hoping to get the attention of somebody to take a look at this project and and start to think, yes, if you start looking at this to the south where there's a stray six-meter inter- intersection of 14 gram per ton gold that was never really followed up near an old tiny mercury mine, uh, maybe there is a lot more to this project uh, than has historically uh, been 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 understood. Maybe there is something really big lurking here. And of course, you get the small valuation associated with the skepticism that this is the case. But this is what uh, resource junior speculation is all about. So I'm nominating um, Lorraine Copper's Lust Dust project as a new Discovery Watch candidate. John, thanks for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been talking with John Kaiser, his website, kaiserresearch.com. Discovery Watch will be back next week. I'm Jim Gondry. Comments made on Discovery Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at howstreet.com. Discovery Watch is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.